Um, before I start, let me make clear the terms of engagement. Um, I uh, am, as um, the President has said, the Australian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. But I understand that I've been invited to speak uh, as an alumnus of this university, uh, as a member of this union, um, and as an alumnus of Magdalen in particular, to reflect upon the career that I have had in the years since I graduated. So what I have to say is personal, uh, and it is nothing to do with the statement of Australian government policy. I speak as, a, as, a, as an individual, not as a government official. It's 40 years since I first came to this room in the Michaelmas term of 1981. And it is a depressing but remorselessly um, inevitable fact that 40 years is a very long time. I remember very clearly the first debate I came to, the debates were on Friday nights in those days. The first debate I came to in week one of Michaelmas of 1981. The president of the union in those days was William Hague. And I remember him at the dispatch box as clearly as if it was yesterday. And I thought, this guy is the best debater I have ever seen. His voice, his very distinctive voice, um, carried the room. And what was also striking about him, apart from his fluency and his wit, was the leonine golden locks uh, which he sported. Of course, he wasn't the only one with leonine golden locks in those faraway days. The Oxford I came to in 1981 was a place which was in the throes of regret at the election about 18 months earlier of Margaret Thatcher. There was deep skepticism, if not hostility, to the even more recent election to the presidency of the United States of Ronald Reagan. And among we Australians, apart from those like me who are on the conservative side of politics, there was no shortage of loathing of the Australian Prime Minister, Malcolm Fraser. Who would have thought that before the decade was out, those three statesmen or stateswomen were on their way to becoming liberal heroes? Malcolm Fraser, in particular because of all Australian prime ministers, he, because of his uncompromising, absolutely uncompromising hatred of racism, brought to completion the repeal from Australian immigration law of racially discriminatory policy, which 20 years previously called the White Australia policy had been a bipartisan consensus, wound back first by Harold Holt, then by Gough Whitlam, and completed by Malcolm Fraser. Who would have thought, because intelligent opinion at the time, in the early 1980s, wrote him off as a buffoon and a B-grade movie actor, that Ronald Reagan, because of his moral clarity and fixity of purpose would end the Cold War. And perhaps her re rehabilitation in liberal eyes took a little longer. Certainly in the autumn of 1981, it seemed unimaginable that Margaret Thatcher would succeed in ending the declinist narrative of the United Kingdom that have been shared by both sides of politics ever since the Second World War, that Britain was a nation inevitably in decline, and the task of government was to gently manage its descent into respectable but genteel poverty. <laughs> 
The Thatcher revolution of the 1980s, immensely controversial, immensely divisive, particularly because of her assaults on the trade unions like the National Union of Miners, paved the way for the decade of prosperity that the United Kingdom enjoyed beginning in the late 1980s. And I know her historical record is still the matter, a subject of much contest. But undoubtedly, I can tell you, the expectations when I arrived in Oxford, and I was first in this room in the second week of October 1981, that, the, that Margaret Thatcher would go down as one of the great prime ministers of the 20th century was unimaginable. It is, as I said, 40 years, almost to the month since then, and a lot has happened. And I ask myself in reflecting on what I might say to you tonight, what I, as a 26-year-old, I do myself an injustice, a 24-year-old, a 24-year-old would have expected had I been able to foresee what the subsequent dec decades would bring. And my conclusion is that I would never have imagined that the world would have improved so much. And in saying that, I don't mean to be glib. I don't mean for a second to suggest that there are not today in 2021 intractable and difficult and immensely challenging and foreboding issues. But what I mean is that the direction of travel of global politics in the 40 years since I was first in this room has been overall an encouraging one. Let me quote you a couple of metrics. According to the World Bank, in 1981, 42.7% of the world's people lived in extreme poverty. Today, that figure is 9.3%. World Vision tells us in its recent report that since 1990, more than 1.2 billion people have risen from poverty. There has never in the history of the world been a time in which poverty, especially in the world's poorest nations, has been more alleviated than in the last 40 years. Take another metric. The average global life expectancy in 1981 was 63 years, a little more for women, a little less for men. Today, the average life expectancy is 10 years longer than that, 73 years. The literacy rate in 1981 was 70 per cent. Today, it is almost 90 per cent. The infant mortality rate was 11.3 per cent. Today, it is closer to 3.5 per cent. It was close to 3.5 per cent. And if we look beyond dry statistics, if we look at political reform, social reform, empowerment, there are more democracies today than there were in 1981, but the rate at which countries have become democracies in the last 40 years has been at a greater rate than at any time in human history. The treatment of minorities, and again, I'm not being glib, I, I don't for a moment depreciate or 
or discountenance or, or, or minimise the fact that there is a long way to go. The treatment of minorities across the world, the treatment of women who, of course, are not a minority, the treatment of racial minorities, the treatment of sexual minorities, the treatment of religious minorities, again with significant exceptions, is Im has immensely advanced in the last 40 years. In Australia, except in the state of New South Wales, 40 years ago it was a crime to be homosexual. It's inconceivable that the idea of gay marriage would even be thought of. And yet today, it is regarded as a human right. So, without being Panglossian or overlooking the deep problems that each generation faces, I would say that if my 24-year-old self had thought about what would happen in the next 40 years to the world, I wouldn't have anticipated the end of the Cold War so soon. I wouldn't have anticipated the liberation of minorities so soon. I might have anticipated, though not to the extent that, I, that has happened, the alleviation of global poverty. And I compare that time the first time I was in this room with the previous 40 years or so. One of the most memorable things I witnessed in this room when I was an undergrad, when I was a student, was a speech in the Hillary term of 1983. It occurred on the 50th anniversary of the famous or the infamous King and Country debate. In February 1933, when the Oxford Union passed a motion, by a majority of almost two to one, by the way, that this House would not fight for King or Country. We know from the historical record that that resolution by that generation of students in this chamber was noticed by and emboldened Adolf Hitler, who concluded wrongly that the English ruling class lacked the spine to fight. The reason I reference the king and country debate is because I was here on the 50th anniversary when that debate was reprised in February 1983. I was sitting right up there, right there. And one of the speakers in that debate was a very old man by then, Lord Hume, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, who himself as a young man had been a student at Christchurch. And he rose to the dispatch box right there. And I was watching and he said something that I thought was astonishing. I was just a suburban boy from Brisbane. I'd read about the history of the 20th century. And there's this very old man. He stood up to make his contribution to the king and country debate 50th anniversary reprise. And he opened his speech with the words, when I accompanied Mr. Chamberlain to Berchtesgarten, in 1938, to meet Herr Hitler. And then he proceeded to tell the story. Because you see, Alec Douglas Hume had been Chamberlain's PPS in 1938, and he went with him to Munich. In the 45 years between then and when I first came here in the early 1980s, the world saw more violence, more slaughter, yet through war, through genocide, through enforced famine, 
through violent, ideologically driven state activity than it had ever seen in the entirety of human history before. So that generation, the generation who enjoyed Oxford, came to this chamber in the 1930s. Their half century was a half century of horror. My generation, my 40 or so years, was a half century hardly without its challenges, but a half century in which democracy, liberty, tolerance, the alleviation of poverty were the principal pulse of global history. And I say that that is because in that half century, the values of freedom and democracy, tolerance, intellectual freedom, economic freedom, freedom to trade, freedom to love, freedom to debate, gripped the world. Today, of course, as we know, those values are under challenge, more, under more challenge than at any time in my adult lifetime. And who can know what the next 40 years will bring? But there is one thing of which we can be absolutely certain, and that is that in the next 40 years, it will not be my generation, but yours, that makes the decision whether the next half century will be a century of horror, like the half century after the king and country debate, that I saw Alec Douglas Hume remember in this room, or the last 40 years or so, which for all its shortcomings, failures, disappointments, threats, challenges, intolerances, vexations, has been a 40 years in which, because of liberal values, the world has become a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brandis, for your very personal reflection. And what an excellent opening remark, uh, looking ahead to the next 40 years. But I want to get to the heart of your, your remark, which is liberal values. You often describe yourself as a liberal Democrat. What do you think are the core of those values? And how did you arrive to that position regarding yourself as a liberal Democrat? And over the course of your political career, have there been moments that make you question your political belief? Well, look, may I, may I call you Chen? Chiang Kai. Chiang Kai. Kai um, I think I am a liberal democrat, though I don't really describe myself as a liberal democrat. I, I describe myself as a classical liberal. But I think we mean this, I think we're talking about the same thing. Um, there are things that have. Uh, oh, you, you asked me so what I think are the core values that comprise that worldview. And I would say that they are a congeries of values including equality and respect. And by that I mean that we all have to respect the fact that every individual is different. Every individual is their own sovereign being. We, of course, live in a society. We are socialized individuals. But nevertheless, 
I mean, I quoted this in my maiden speech in the parliament in 2000, a remark of Immanuel Kant, which I think sums it up very well, which is, he, Immanuel Kant said, treat every person as an end in themselves and not as a means to an end. To me, my philosophy is based on the view that there is an irreducible core of individual sovereignty that every human being enjoys and in right of being a human, enjoying, uh, a human being enjoys equally and that everybody else for that reason in a liberal society has to respect that. And where the rubber hits the road, it means they have to respect difference. They have to respect difference of viewpoint. They have to respect difference of lifestyles. They have to respect difference of worldview. They have to respect the fact that just as I may hold certain beliefs or attitudes passionately, everybody else is equally entitled to hold their views passionately. They have to respect that and they have to tolerate it. Even though, and this is why I find this whole, you know, cancel culture debate so annoying, for example, because it assumes that there is a moral superiority among some to impose their moral values upon those who they regard as having inferior moral values. I think that's profoundly anti-liberal and profoundly inegalitarian. Everybody has to tolerate each other's point of view, they have to tolerate each other's lifestyles, they have to tolerate each other's religious faith or the lack of it. That to me is the core of what I would call classical liberalism. And I think liberalism has become, particularly in the United States, but also elsewhere, somewhat diseased by the replacement or displacement of that view by a view that liberalism means that there is a privileged set of values which can be imposed irrespective. Um, now, and that goes to the, the second part of your question. Um, I don't like intolerant liberalism. I don't like intolerance. In a tolerant society, we have to tolerate every difference. We have to tolerate the intolerant. We have to tolerate every difference. Doesn't mean we condone it, but we have to accept it, that that is, that everybody has their point of view and everybody has their life choices. Um, I also find, certainly in Australian politics, I found, and I said this in my valedictory speech, that there is, on the right wing of politics, the far right wing, a kind of right-wing postmodernism has emerged, which absolutely defies both liberalism, because it's intolerant of freedom of the individual, but is also profoundly anti-conservative, because it's intolerant of institutions as well. So I think that's always threatening. Mm -hmm. I want to pick up on the liberal notion of equality and respect you've cherished so much. You played a pivotal role in successfully advocating for the passage of marriage equality in Australia. And you were arguably one of the most high profile cabinet minister as attorney general to offer a progressive voice within your own party. Would you mind sharing with us your experience of fighting for same sex marriage and what kind of obstacles have you came across? Well, I ended up becoming a very strong advocate for marriage equality. And in fact, by coincidence, this weekend is four years to the day since I moved the second reading of the bill in the Senate. It, start, we, it started in the Senate. The Senate was where it was going to get the most opposition. Once it was through the Senate, it was kind of rubber stamped in the House of Representatives. So the real political battle was in the Senate and I move the second reading on the 28th of November, 2017. Um, 
I've got to tell you, I was a late convert to that issue. There were others than me who were advocating in Australia for marriage equality before I was. Um, and there are, in the speech I gave in the second reading debate, I mentioned some of the insufficiently appreciated heroes, of which, to those Australians in the audience, of whom I believe there are quite a few, you may, if you follow Australian politics, have heard of a rather colourful and flamboyant man from North Queensland called Warren Ench, um, who was raising this issue in the Howard government, you know, 15 years before it became fashionable. Um, and I think he is the father of marriage equality in Australia, as a matter of fact. Um, it was not supported by any Prime Minister, Labor or Liberal, until Malcolm Turnbull came along. Tony, uh, John Howard was against it. In fact, John Howard amended the Marriage Act to say a marriage was between a man and a woman. Uh, Julia Gillard was against it. Kevin Rudd was against it. Tony Abbott was against it. Malcolm Turnbull was in favour of it and it was because he permitted it to happen that it was able to happen. He was a, a bit of a reluctant ally, I've got to say, but he was an ally. Um, it consumed a lot of my, the last 18 months that I was in Parliament. And I actually got a lot more done in my last year in Parliament because I decided to go. I told Malcolm a year before I retired that I wanted to leave at the next reshuffle. So I had a year to do, you know, to spend all my political capital, basically, and I decided to spend it on that. Um, it was tricky. I mean, a lot of the people in the gay community, it was a, the, the politics in the gay community, I discovered, were extremely vicious, and it was like hurting cats in a way. But um, they were very offended by the idea of a plebiscite, and I can understand why. But I've got to say that when that plebiscite came back with a 68%, I think mean it was, result, from that point, not only was it unstoppable, but that was a moment of embrace by the entire community. So that, I think, helped. But, but dealing with the difficult politics of the gay community, dealing with the difficult politics inside the government, um, simultaneously, um, took quite a bit of political, um, well, it, <laughs> it, it was not very easy. Are there any particular obstacles that you've come across in the process, especially within your own party? Well, there were a lot of people in both the Liberal Party and more so the National Party who were against it, sure. Um, but there were also, on the other side of the coin, there were people in the gay community who had a very demanding and, you know, our way or not, not at all attitude. There were even some, you know, very few, I might say, at the extreme, who actually, actually don't think wanted it to happen. They wanted to maintain the victimhood narrative. But in the end, I remember saying to Malcolm once, I said, look, you know, we, want to, we don't want this campaign to be like your Republican campaign in the 1990s and it's all the kind of Kate Blanchett's and the Chardonnay sippers of, of the eastern suburbs of Sydney telling people what to think. We want it to be the mums of gay kids. We want it to be the uncles of, 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 of gay girls. We want it to be from the community, not in a sort of an elitist view of the world projected down, but a reflection of the common decency of Australian families projected universally. Mm -hmm. um, looking back to your speech, you made the reflection on the course of history, how that has changed from 1933 to 1983, and how you had 40 years old from when you were a student here at the Union. Well, it might be unfair to ask you to predict what the world is going to be in 40, 50 years' time, but it would be a shame to not get your outlook on some geopolitical issues. I think one thing I particularly want to mention is that summer, the UK Prime Minister and the Australian Prime Minister has agreed on a historic trade deal. And in September, UK and Australia join in a security trilateral pact. 
What would you say the future of UK Australia relationship, and what are the challenges and opportunities that they might lie in the future? Well, I, I think the UK Australia relationship is going through a bit of a purple patch at the moment. Um, that is in part because of Brexit, and the, you know, whatever you think of Brexit, inevitably one of its consequences was that. Um, the um, United Kingdom is seeking to redefine its role in the world. And plainly, um, that means a future which looks beyond Europe and beyond the North Atlantic. Um, in 1968, Harold Wilson, the then UK Prime Minister, announced that Britain didn't acknowledge it had any significant strategic interests of east, interests east of Suez. That was walked back a little bit from um, uh, in the years since they maintained a naval presence, for example, in Singapore. But by and large, since 1968, that was the whole point of British strategic policy. And then in 1973, they joined what was then called the European Economic Community and they terminated their, effectively terminated their trading relationships with Australia um, and um, with our region of the world. Now, both the strategic um, posture taken in 1968 and the economic slash mercantile posture taken in 1973 are obsolete as a result of Brexit. And it does come at a time in which, as we all know, the Indo-Pacific region is going to be, already is, but will, but will continue to be at an accelerating rate, in fact, the, um, the, the engine of global growth. So roughly two thirds of the people who become middle class in between now and 2050 will be in East Asia. Um, so, Britain does define its interests, particularly its commercial interests and trading interests, in reaching out to the Indo-Pacific and Australia as you know, its most like-minded fellow G20 nation in the Indo-Pacific is the most obvious partner. And that's why, I th that's the main reason I think that um, there is this period of great, you know, more, more intense than usual engagement between the United Kingdom and Australia uh, at the minute. Mm -hmm. well, I want to point to another bilateral relationship, perhaps not as rosy as this one we just talked about. Australian-China relation used to be the one based on strong economic ties, but in recent years, it has deteriorated rapidly. Where do you see the future of Australia-China relation lie? Well, there there is a period of, of difficulty and choppiness at the moment, as we all know. I wouldn't overstate it, by the way. I mean, Australia, China continues to be by far Australia's biggest trading partner. We continue to have a free trade agreement with China. Um, China has always understood that Australia is a liberal democracy whose key strategic relationship in the Pacific is with the United States, has both a different worldview and different strategic interests from China, with a different worldview, a different system of government and different strategic interests. That being said, um, the last couple of years, the relationship has um, been um, as deteriorated I think that Australia has absolutely done the right thing in standing up for our values. Um, the Chinese, the then Chinese ambassador to Australia last year published a list of like a kind of log of complaints as it were about Australia. He published it. It was in a slight, slightly, um, <laughs> way reminiscent of President Woodrow Wilson, there were 14 points. And 
On the list of, 40, of these 14 grounds of complaint, one was that China was attacked in our parliament. One was that Chinese policy was attacked in our media. Now, Australia isn't going to cease to be a country in which there isn't freedom of speech in the parliament, in which there isn't going to be freedom of the press. Another was, this is one I was with my fault, I suppose, uh, was that we had passed laws to deal with foreign interference in Australian politics, which, although country agnostic, were taken by the Chinese to be directed at them. But we know that there was interference in Australian politics. Clive Hamilton wrote a book about it um, by Chinese um, surrogates that Australia was entitled to protect itself against and the legislation was um, country agnostic in any event. And there were others as well. Now my point is that nothing Australia has done in that may have contributed to the current state of relations with China has been provocative or at variance from Australia merely defending our interests and values as a liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your response. Now I want to open up to all members of the audience. If you do have a question, please raise your hand uh, and I can um, select you. A member of our team will come with the mic. A member there. Thank you um, for your great speech tonight. I just had a quick question about um, your personal opinion on the selection process of High Court judges in Australia and whether you think Australia should look towards moving towards a more transparent approach like something that's adopted in the UK. Well, that's a good question and it's something I've thought about because when I was the Attorney General, I was the minister who took recommendations for the High Court to Cabinet. Let me tell you how it works, right? There is a formal process ordained by the Judiciary Act. I'm sorry for the normal words, this might sound a little bit kind of inside the beltway, but indulge me. Um, so that you have to write to um, the State Attorneys General asking their thoughts. And they sort of predictably say, well, you know, we think justice belongs of our Supreme Court or uh, you know, Mrs. YQC of our bar is the outstanding lawyer in the country. You know, they always say that. It's probably true in some cases. Um, so you write to the State Attorneys General. Um, I adopted the practice of writing to the Shadow Attorney General. That wasn't mandatory, but I thought it was a good thing to do. Um, and then you consult by convention with all of the people who are most likely to be best informed about who the quality is, the bar associations, the law societies, um, the Women Lawyers Association gets um, consulted, others do as well. Now this is an informal process. Um, and also, I would consult each of the High Court judges of the existing High Court confidentially and individually. Um, it was quite an odd process, actually, because I would say to each of the High Court judges, now as a sitting member of the High Court, you, of course, are yourself a candidate, but I want you to express to me your views about other potential candidates, um, which I obviously kept very, very confidential. Now, that was all a process of private consultation. But here's the test. The test is, are the appointees acknowledged to be good appointees by those in the position to judge them, their professional peers, um, the legal commentators? Um, no attorney general, no government wants to appoint the wrong person. Now, I appointed three High Court judges and a Chief Justice. If I may say so, every single one of those appointments was well received. And you've got a lot of power as Attorney General when it comes to selection because 
by and large, most of the people in the cabinet you know, have never heard of these people. I mean, they're trusting you. You're, they're trusting your judgment. But it's the reputational interest in choosing the best person that I think protects the integrity of the system. Now, the same you'd say about other tiers of the judiciary. The other thing that I thought was quite, it was, was pretty obvious to me, and you know, I went through this process several times, is the shortlist is kind of self-selecting. I mean, there are hardly any people in the Australian judiciary or legal profession who, if you are appointing for non-tokenistic reasons, but merely on the strength of professional esteem, who are worthy? I mean, the number of names that, in respect of any given appointment to the High Court that I did, I reckon there would have been fewer than a dozen names on the list. Because as in any cohort of human beings, you kind of know who the most eminent are. But I only chose from among the most eminent. Now that process doesn't have the quality of transparency. I acknowledge that. But transparency is not an absolute criterion. The ultimate test is getting the best person. Well, thank you for an excellent address, uh, High Commissioner. I have a question regarding the, um, the terrible C word, coronavirus. Um, so as we've both seen the differing coronavirus pandemic responses um, in the UK versus Australia, I, mean, I think um, most people would agree that Australia was more willing to perhaps um, enact measures which might be perhaps described to curtail people's liberties, such as quick and sharp lockdowns versus the UK in which they took a more liberal approach and which they tried to, I guess, maintain as much liberty as possible until it became absolutely necessary to lock down in a certain sense. Um, some people who I guess would describe themselves like high, in high profile people who describe themselves like, as defenders of liberty of freedom might argue that um, perhaps Australia's approach was too draconian and it, perhaps it weakens the case of liberty and human rights and freedoms in Australia overall. Um, I'd like to ask about your thoughts more overall, whether you think there is a legacy, um, there will be a legacy of these coronavirus emergency um, acts, whether this will really leave a lasting impact on Australian liberty and freedom, or whether it's just, it's overblown um, compared to, it's overblown compared to how some people are making it out to be. Well, I hope not. You know, obviously, I hope not. Um, the, a couple of things to say. I mean, remember that most of this regulation was state government regulation. And it was interesting that the states, you know, adopted a more or less uh, draconian view of this. Remember also that because it was only early last year that this started to emerge and we all experienced it ourselves, everyone in this room. You remember in the early days, we didn't have a clear sense of the gravity or magnitude of the threat. And so policymakers were making decisions under conditions of uncertainty. Now, I'm sure there are some of you students here who are students of philosophy or logic, and you know, I know that there's a whole sub-discipline about of, of, you know, uh, making decision-making under conditions of uncertainty and, uh, and, and, and uh, what the, the various modes and, and, and techniques of decision-making are. But I think before we sort of adopt a, an ideologically liberal critique, we need to bear in mind that nobody knew what they were dealing with. They literally didn't know what they were dealing with. And I think we would all acknowledge that this is scalable, that there are some circumstances in which inhibitions and restrictions on liberty um, in urgent circumstances are more justified than in others. So you put those two together, that it was known that these were urgent circumstances, but the magnitude 
of the required response was an unknown. I think you can understand why governments defaulted to a more precautionary view. Um, now, so I'm not going to embark on a critique of the way in which different Australian states or indeed the national government handle it. But I think in judging it, you have to bear those things in mind. But to your ultimate question, does it mean that there's been a shift in the mindset to be more uh, uh, receptive to more illiberal techniques for dealing with um, unrelated um, uh, issues? I hope not. <laughs> Earlier in the term, we actually had a debate on this, the motion being uh, this house would give up liberty for safety. And the members of this union voted for the motion. But I hope that result is not as consequential as the keen and country debate <laughs> you've, you've referenced uh, earlier in your remark. But on this broad Australian-UK comparison point, in your experience, you've been a very seasoned politician in Australia, and now you've served in the UK for, um, for a few years now. What do you observe the biggest difference in political culture and politics more broadly? Between the two countries? Yeah, between Australia and the UK. I think people in the United Kingdom are certainly more polite. <laughs> <laughs> um, when uh, um, Angela Rayner called the Conservative Party scum and it was a front page story, I thought, goodness me, that you wouldn't get a line in the Daily Telegraph if somebody said that in the New South Wales Parliament about a political opponent. Um, so I think the political culture here is more, um, is, is uh, less belligerent. But I also think paradoxically that the range of dispute is wider. I mean, you had, as the leader of the opposition before Keir Starmer, a man whose political positions uh, were characterised by an extreme view of socialism, by racism, if you regard anti-Semitism as racism, which I do. Um, and I mean, it's inconceivable that a person with positions as extreme as that would ever be entertained in the Australian parliament. So I think, in, this, in Australia, the, gra the, co the common ground is closer, but more belligerently fought. I've got more questions. Remember that, yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Um, you mentioned republicanism, and that. Well, I was born after 1975, obviously. And um, I, when I first read about, you know, Whitlam being dismissed by the Governor General in 75, I, I was really shocked that that happened, you know, because to me it was almost like, you know, the not to get controversial, but, you know, the Queen, she's not Australian and she... Basically, I thought it wouldn't, I would have preferred it was, you know, fixed democratically with the people voting. And so, you know, what do you think of that decision? And, you know, do you think she should continue to be our head of state when, yeah? Well, um, I, I know a lot about the dismissal because I remember it very well, but also, full disclosure, in subsequent years, I came to be a very close friend of Sir John Kerr's, the Governor General who dismissed the Whitlam government. And I also got to know Gough Whitlam quite well too, by the way. Um, and I discussed the dismissal with John Kerr a lot. Um, now, you mentioned in the same question, the Queen and the dismissal. Let's be very clear, the Queen, and the UK, it's a, broadly, had absolutely nothing to do with the dismissal. Absolutely nothing. Um, that was a decision taken by John Kerr as Governor General without reference to, in fact, he went to abundant caution 
not to involve the palace. So that's the first point. There are some who ignorantly assert otherwise in Australia, and they're wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. Secondly, my view is that Kerr acted properly because you said in your question wouldn't it have been better if it had been decided by the people. It was decided by the people. Um, what happened was Kerr, when he interviewed Whitlam on the 11th of November 1975, gave him the option of calling an election and Whitlam refused. The Senate had blocked the supply bills. That meant that on the advice to government, pensions, all government payments, salaries to the public service, everyone else, the military, doctors, nurses in the public sector, were going to run out by the end of that year. It was absolutely outrageous in those circumstances that Whitlam, as the sitting Prime Minister, didn't take it to the people and say, make the case, what the Senate is doing is disgraceful. And I think if he'd done that, he would have won. But rather than that, he refused to do that he decided to try and stare down the Senate and failed. And because this was an intractable dispute, the Governor General decided that the only way of resolving it was to have an election which if Whitlam wouldn't advise him to hold, he commissioned Fraser, the opposition leader, who did advise him to hold. Now, the one respect in which I think Kerr can be criticised, is that he didn't make it apparent to Whitlam earlier in the piece, confidentially, their first meeting was on the 12th of October on this issue after the Senate block supply for the first time, that he didn't privately and confidentially make it clear to Whitlam that in the event that the dispute was irresolvable, that was an option he would have to consider. So Whitlam's claim that Kerr misled him, I think you could understand why Whitlam said that. Great. We've got time for one final question. Questions? Um, the member there wearing a face mask. <clears throat> So just reflecting on your comments that you made earlier about um, going back to this modern Australian diplomacy and also what you talked about in relation to the Australian-China relationship being one which is not provocative but at the same time um, being very aware of standing up for the values that our parliament's kind of based on, our society's based on. At the same time, I wonder what you would say of in recent months there's not just been politicians in Australia but also members of the bureaucracy um, who've talked about in relation to the Taiwan issue about it being um, about comments such as like the drums of war beating and and comments around that and obviously as a diplomatic official it, you probably want to be quite careful of this, but at the same time, I just wondered what your thoughts were more broadly about whether these sorts of diplomatic issues um, should be so contested in a public forum or, or being um, drawn out in the media as opposed to being negotiated behind closed doors, which is the argument that some commentators in Australia or foreign policy officials have suggested might be a better way of, of thinking or, or working through these sorts of disputes. So I just wondered what your thoughts were about that. Well, I completely agree with you. And I say that in a bit of a false position tonight because I, in a way I'm doing the, the opposite myself, but I did sort of uh, announce at the start of my remarks that trigger warning that, you know, I'm speaking as an alumnus of this university and uh, a, a sort of a former public figure, not as a, a diplomat myself. But I think um, public servants should not um, 
I think it's for minister, prime ministers and ministers to publicly make those comments. The statement about the drums of war was a very foolish statement in my view, very foolish indeed. Great. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for for tonight's conversation. But if you are successful in Dallas, you're all invited to join the High Commissioner for a drink afterwards in the Glaston Room. Please all join me to thank his visit to Ms. Bennett. <laughs>